be here at some point, but this meeting is being recorded. We'll let people in and see if see if things are going on in there before we start. We always are busy, so I hate waiting too long. So <laughs> can I just interrupt to say thank you to Kelly for her great minutes? Um just really thankful that you're doing those. Wow, thank you. That actually that means a lot to me because I'm I'm trying really hard and I never know if I'm capturing too much detail. So if they're ever too long, please let me know. They're great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. That that is awesome to hear. Okay. Let's see. Well, we've let in our audience. So um we are recording, so I'm gonna get started. Give me a second here. Here we go. Um, seeing a presence of a quorum, I am calling this March 16th, 2023, regular meeting of the Community Resources Committee to order at 4.32 p.m. Um, pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapters 22 and 107 of the Acts of 2022, this meeting is going to be conducted by remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so on Zoom or telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time. Um, this is, meeting is also being recorded. And so at this point, I'm going to take attendance, which will also confirm that we can hear each other and everyone can hear them, every, you know, we can hear and be heard. Um, I think I'm first in alphabetical, so I am present, uh, Pam Rooney. Present. And Jennifer Tom? Present. Pat DeAngelis will not be here today, and I have not heard from Shalini, so we'll keep eye on when she arrives, and if so, we'll check to make sure um, that she can hear everything. So with that, um, we're going to go on to our agenda. We have no public hearings today. Our action items, we're going to start with the planning board and ZBA impending vacancies. Um, the first thing we need to do is bulletin board notices. Um, and so the procedure requires the committee to approve them before they're posted, essentially, or at least view them and suggest any changes before they get posted. Um, and then we will post them and we cannot um, essentially close the application period until at, at a minimum 14 days after they are posted. So that is, if people are wondering why we're starting so early, it is because there's minimum time periods and sometimes it takes a while. Um, I just recognize that Shalini has joined us at 434. So Shalini, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Excellent, thank you. So um, Pam did a wonderful job at drafting these. Thank you, Pam, for taking on the role of drafting both of these impending vacancy notices. Um, with that, there's also in the packet an updated ZBA handout, I believe is what it is, because the contact at the planning staff has changed. So that is, I think, the only change on that handout. Um, that shows that the bulletin board notice, we need to get that handout uploaded and then the correct link into the bulletin board notice before we publish the notice, um, which is why there's a couple of things there. Uh, with those two notices, are there any requested changes? Or before I do that, Pam, would you like to talk anything more about them or summarize them beyond? No, no it just says that there are X number of vacancies open. I chose to um, incorporate both the associate members and full member openings for ZBA rather than having two separate notices. If someone is at all interested, going to one spot and seeing both opportunities made more sense to me than this around through, you know, who knows how many uh, notices for the same information. Um, and then, um, as you suggested, double checking to make sure the links worked, I did get to the handout and I didn't realize that the handout was actually something that, that CRC had created as a little blurb about ZBA. And so that needed to get updated. Chris pointed out that they didn't actually have control over it. And that's when I realized it was a CRC document. So anyway, it's with, it's with Athena to be um, uploaded again in our in our documents and the link reestablished. So when someone goes to this posting, they can click on it and they can actually read the handout. So that's the gist of it. And there are actually, so so interestingly, there are 
three uh, impending vacancies on the planning board. I can't believe that it's been three years that um, Johanna Newman, uh, Andrew McDougall, and Tom Long were just, a, it feels like yesterday that they were appointed. So those three are there. And then there are two uh, full um, members of the ZBA who could stand for reappointment or, but it's an impending vacancy. And then of course, the annual update of the, um, of the associate members, most of whom we just filled about three months ago. Any questions, comments, or requests for changes to the proposed bulletin board notices other than the update where we'll fix the link that we need to fix? I move we accept the, the posting notices and allow Athena to do her posting. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Did you also want to say something, Jennifer? No, I'm just seconding. <laughs> okay. Um, any just other comment? Really quickly, could you repeat that motion once more, please? It was a little glib, but it was actually that that we approve the, the notices as written and turned over to you to be posted on the Amherst Town Bulletin Board. Excellent. I've got it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Seeing no other comments, we will take a vote. I'm going to start with Shalini. Yes. Mandy is an I. Uh, Pam. Yes. And Jennifer. Yes. That is a four to zero with one absent. Vote unanimously. Um, Pam and I will work on coordinating to make sure those get posted and that the correct link goes in the notice for um, for the ZBA. Note to myself. Um, with that, we are going to move on to um, residential rental bylaw and the regulations. We have Dave Zomak here and Rob Mora. I'm going to make sure I have been hosted. So just bear with me as I manage the host stuff too, just to make sure stuff. Um, we have discussed the bylaw. The newest draft of the bylaw is in there with all the discussions we've made it through, but we've never gone through the regulations. Once we go through the regulations, if we have more time, if it takes us less than 45 minutes, we may go back to the bylaw to make sure the two conform, because uh, there were some questions about do they conform or not. Um, but my hope is we can at least get through the regulations and then potentially send these or talk about whether to send them off to the attorney or what our next steps are on these. Um, we're getting, I think, close to being able to do send them report back to the council with them, and we need to decide what that report's going to look like um, in terms of what the motion's going to look like and how close we are to that. Um, so with that, I'm going to pull up the regulations. Um, we had gotten, um, I, I am going to pull up the regulations that were in the packet, but with um, revisions requested by Rob. He was kind enough to send them. I know it is probably they were sent so late that not everyone has been able to read them, myself included, um, but I tried to get them out when I got them. I thank Rob for sending them. Um, but I'll put that one on the screen since um, it may not be in the packet right now either, although I have requested that it make it into the packet. Um, and so we will do our best and then everyone will be able to see but but the goal of this is to go through and see what um we want uh, are there any changes people want to the regulations as we start to finalize these so we're looking specifically at the drafts um so um, we're going to start with application requirements and we're going to start with um section a1 um Let's start through H because I is its own thing, I think. So are there any, does anyone have any requested changes to A1, A through H? Um, and then we can also 
talk about whether um, we can look at Rob's changes too, which Rob's changes on this draft are everything in blue. Um, I believe each each person's draft may show a different color, but in this one, it's blue. Pam. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, somewhere in here, it's in section H2, uh, response to a voicemail left in December by the township we returned or responded to within one hour. That's always been a question for me. I think Mandy Jo also had a question mark on that. Um, a response to a message, I would like to say a response to a message left on this number by a tenant shall be returned or responded. So it, I don't know if voicemail is the thing. It could be a text. It doesn't have to be voicemail per se, I would guess. If we could change a response to a message. No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I just want to make guess. sure I was tracking changes. Sorry. You want it to read. Yeah. And actually there are two accounts for that. The next sentence also is a response to a message. So I wanted to talk about this one too. Um, one hour. I, I guess my question would be to Rob. Um, what does a res what what counts as a response? Um, you know, and what happens if a, if there isn't a response within an hour? You know, um, I'm I'm actually thinking about like small landlords here that might own one property or something. Um, you know, one in three hours if they take a vacation, they might not have cell service at some point, or you know, they if they do, they might be on a plane, right? And you can't respond. Like, like what what's the I understand what the goal of this is, but what happens um for this? And is there better wording? Is it sh is shall the right wording or should be it is should the actual word we should be thinking about here should be re returned in and all so i'd like rob's thoughts on this so I, yeah i mean the goal here is to to make the point that um you know a a, a response a, an immediate response is necessary and of course this is for situations when you know we really need to talk to somebody so the expectation is higher at that point. So, um, you know, I think it's fine. You know, I'm also, I think I'd also be fine with it saying, you know, should. Um, I, you know, I think what we want to be able to do is, if ever needed, have the conversation with a property owner or a manager to say their response wasn't adequate. You need to make things, make, you know, make changes. You need to, you um, talk to your property manager and make sure that their you know scope of services includes this type of response or maybe you need to get somebody to fill in for you when you're traveling uh because they own a property that you know uh has has issues so um yeah i think i think it's okay uh it's basically what we expect now i think it's it's pretty reasonable to think that you'll get a call back a text message an email back in response within an hour um, it's it's usually um, unlikely for it to go on uh, for a longer period of time than that. Thank you. Um, I have two other questions. One is E um, and one is G. And, you know, in, in some sense, I like Rob's changes. I think it originally read the total number of occupants in each dwelling unit, um, which is hard. And so the changes of some of this, the maximum total number of unrelated occupants as indicated on the lease and or enforced by the owner makes a little more sense. The question I have with this one and with G is if under federal law, which I think is the case for the Fair Housing Act, a landlord cannot ask about marital status, how do you know whether the occupants are unrelated? Especially, you know, even with G, not related by marriage, civil union, blood, adoption, guardianship of that. If you can't actually ask about marital status and relationship status, how do you answer E and G legally? 
Um, presumably you might be able to ask about educational attendance, right? But but the familial relationships that go into being able to answer E and G, I'm not sure legally landlords can actually ask. So how do we get the, how do we include this in here without requiring landlords to either just make up a number or break the law? And I don't know whether anyone has an answer to that, but um, Jennifer and oh, Rob and then Jennifer. Uh, I was just going to say that they're not necessarily asking the question. What they're doing is telling us through their application requirements that their lease has a provision that uh, no more than so many unrelated individuals. And I would hope they're referencing our bylaw requirement for occupancy limits. And that's really what the goal of this is, is to have the landlord tell us uh, what they establish as the appropriate number. It might be connected to a land use permit. It might be something else. And that they're actually going to be the ones to, to manage that and respond to it if there are any issues uh, related to occupancy. Okay, so that's that's E. You don't think it actually E in your mind doesn't ask about actual occupancy. It doesn't have to. They don't have to ask that question of their tenant. Okay, because that's more about a lease thing. But uh, Jennifer and then Pam. Yeah, so I realize this may not be the case in every situation. You know where uh, properties are rented to students, but I know that when both my daughters were in college, living off campus. The, they'd fill out the lease application. One of the first questions would be, you know, occupation. They put student, and then immediately, so there, if there were four of them, which there usually were, living in an apartment, each person had their own lease because you were only responsible for one quarter of the rent. And then, because you were a student without an income, you had to have a guarantor for the rent, who was usually a parent. So the landlords were very clear that these were four unrelated students because each basically had their own lease with their own guarantor. And <clears throat> if you, like I know this junior year, my daughter wasn't there second semester. So we were responsible for her portion of the lease until she found a replacement that was acceptable to the landlord and the other roommates. So I guess there was no ambiguity from the landlord's perspective position as to who was renting the unit. So I don't know if that answers the question, but I think it's not usually very ambiguous. And I don't so, know if that can all play into it. Let, let me respond before I go to Pam. So with my own experience, um, before my husband and I were married, he was a student. His occupation was student. I was attorney. We had different last names. We weren't married, but um, they couldn't ask us. And then at one point we were married, right? But they, if I hadn't changed my name, there would have been no, and I'm not sure the lease ever did change my name, there would have been no indication whether we were married or not to be able to answer G. So how would the landlord have answered G with G requiring not related by marriage civil union without actually asking my husband and I whether we were married? Yeah, so I've been in that situation too, but I don't know what that... Um... I mean, we're really trying to, I, I mean, the elephant, you know, we're trying to find out whether they're, they're students, because that's really what the four tenant limit is about. And I'm saying that it's not, can't we just, can you ask that somehow? I mean, it's not ambiguous to the landlord because they, they know because the lease looks different than anybody else for that reason. They're really very separate agreements like if there's four students and one leaves the other three aren't responsible for that fourth uh, person that's rent. actually not how i signed a lease with a roommate when i was a student either i had one lease with two names on it and i was responsible even if the other person didn't pay their part right but i'm saying in college oh. towns they usually make an you know in well, places I, I guess where... you're assuming that's how all leases are and i'm saying it might not be the case and how do you do that but pam uh, <clears throat> yeah I, I think we should um, actually keep this. It, again, it is really striving to identify if someone is at, a, at an institution, an educational institution. Um, I don't wanna tinker with this. Um, the, other, the other point though, from, from good authority, I, I understand that there are leases and then there are leases. One lease is what the town can look at or is given to the town and the other lease is amongst the tenants 
and the numbers of, of occupants may actually be different. I was astounded when I heard this, but um, to me, that's a huge issue. I don't think any of these definitions um, apply to that or, or somehow affect that issue, um, but I wanna come back to it. So, so I just wanna keep G in place. And I'm not comfortable keeping it in place as worded. And it sounds like from Jennifer's comments that she only wants undergrads, but how, I mean, I guess you could ask undergrad or grad, but does it really matter whether they're an undergrad or grad? Like, like, and I'm not comfortable about this one or more persons not related by marriage civil union because that requires asking something the landlords aren't allowed to ask. As I said, my husband and I, we were the only ones on the lease. We weren't married at the time. We had different last names, um, but we were engaged. We signed the lease about a month before we were married. They couldn't ask us whether we were married or not. So if this Italy. goes back- And so how, have, how would they have answered G for us? Our bylaws, our bar, our bylaws have this in it. And that's, you know, we're not gonna go back and change other bylaws. No, the bylaws don't have anything about students. They just have unrelated individuals in it. So are you arguing the student aspect of this description or this definition or? The whole thing. I, I just don't know how you answer the question of not related versus E, which Rob respond, re responded with doesn't actually relate to tenants in places, it relates to lease requirements, how, how they put it in the lease, right, which is different than um, G. I also worry about will attend an educational institution. What, what does that mean? Within a lease period, not within? What if someone does it mid-year? Do they have to update the application? I, I, I see a lot of problems with G. Um, even though I understand at least I think I understand what Pam, you and Jennifer are trying to gather information wise, which I think, correct me if I'm wrong, is number of units who have undergraduate students in them at any one time. Is that is that what you're trying to gather or are you trying to gather information about graduate students too? Is it and is it only oh, okay. units that have only students in it? Or it, I guess that's the other thing I need is more clarity as to what information you're trying to get out of this. Students are students. Whether undergrad or grad, and whether then married or not to a professional. I see Pam nodding her head. I, yeah. Okay, so two of you know um, Pat's Pat's famous line is, "That's what my son did. My son wanted his girlfriend to live with him. Well, they can, they can. Um, then they have two other roommates, and they're in fine shape. There's no issue. There's no reason to be um, worried. And you and you still maintain a cap of four persons, Jennifer." Yeah, I mean, it's it, different towns do it differently. You know, some towns like State College, you have to register as a student house. I mean, we haven't done that. You know, the two houses behind me are always rented. Each house are on a flag lot to four students. I mean, I don't, it, that's just two of them, maybe a couple, um, but they're still only, you know, they, they do seem to follow the bylaw and only have four in each house, but it's, always students. It's not like sometimes it's in it to engage. I mean, I feel like we don't, you know, that there's the goal of what we're trying to do is ensure that there are, I mean, I don't know if this is what it's getting to, but I mean, our bylaw says four students per house, <laughs> per unit, not per house, because a house can be divided into two units. I mean, in my neighborhood, there's triplexes of 12 students because there's four per unit, which is one reason why the four is so essential because if you raise it to six, then you have 12 instead of, no, you have you would have 18 instead of 12 per structure.
but that's what we're trying to get to. And it's there. I mean, other towns have a way of dealing with this, so we should be able to get there too. Shalini. Um, hmm. Can we look at what, I mean, I'm sure someone has in this group looked at what other towns have, because sounds like other there's a way to do this that we can deal with these issues. But I did also want to respond to uh, what we just said earlier, giving um, Pat's example and just any other example for that matter, where there's uh, a couple with other non-couple students staying and to say that you could still be the boyfriend and girlfriend and two other people and that's a solution because I don't think that is because it is kind of, when two are living as a couple they are hoping to divide the rent and so it allows for other people other three rooms to be rented out and this one room so they're you know so it can be divided that couple can divide that so it does offset some of the cost for that couple so I can I don't think it's it's solving that problem. But I understand the problem that we have with if there are three units and then there are four or five or, and there are more, it just gets very crowded. So I get that. Um, but I don't think it's an either or kind of situation. Uh, and I, I guess it's back to Rob, like how do you foresee enforcing? Because we can have all these rules. We've had these rules for a long time but it sounds like they're not being enforced and is there a way to enforce it in a reasonable way that if and this is what i've been saying all along that if there's a property like in my neighborhood there's so much space around homes and if a house can allow and i believe in southeast or some other places where they can allow for five students to be there um, without overcrowding the streets or anything why should we just limit it to four in that situation? Whereas if it's really a crowded neighborhood, why are we even allowing four in that place or 12, you know, there are three units. So is there a way to enforce this that it is based on safety, traffic, and all those considerations that we list out that we don't want garbage, we don't want noise, we don't want uh, cars parked on the street, but is there a way to enforce that? Yeah. So that's my question to Rob. So I'll let Rob answer that, but I want to make sure we stay on track with the regulations, which are not trying to change the four. And the one I've been questioning is G about just identifying number of dwelling units where students live. But I will let, I, I'm just trying to keep us on track. <laughs> um, Rob. Uh, Mandy, I just want to mention John's in the audience. He didn't have the link to get in here. He might be helpful too as we go on with some of this conversation. But um, to respond to that question, um, I, I want to first say that the bylaw is enforced. So I think that's really not accurate to say that it's not being enforced. We respond to complaints, we deal with the unrelated occupants all year, and every uh, you know issue, every situation that we get into does end with some sort of compliance, it takes time. That's, you know, that's definitely um, something that everyone needs to understand when we're dealing with uh, the, over, you know, occupants beyond the number four in a house that is otherwise safe to be living in. Um, we're not doing any proactive enforcement. You know, we never were designed. We have John Thompson's our only code enforcement officer. So there's, there's no effort by the our department to, to go out there and find these problems. But in response to complaints and inspections where they are found, the bylaw is enforced and successfully. And it's and it's always resolved a little bit differently. So there isn't really a, a, a you know a, a, a typical way that it's handled. Uh, so I think we can enforce it. I think it's a big decision to make that you know when we decide to go out there more aggressively uh inspecting properties and finding these situations how they're going to be handled and um you know make sure the expectations are clear that um in most cases it's not resolved immediately and it takes time to bring a property into compliance thanks rob i have i believe brought john in so i i can't see everyone on this list with the way i share but yep john is there okay <laughs> 
Um, Jennifer, then Pam, then welcome, John. Yeah, um, no, the only thing I was gonna say is I did bring up the State College. I don't wanna take time up by reading it now, but it's similar to what that wording was. In State College, Pennsylvania, you have to, you, they have a registry of student houses. So if you're renting to students, they have a definition of what a student is and you have to register your house that way. They, they have a use category similar to non-owner occupied duplex. It's called student house use category. Right. Um, which is slightly different. So Pam. Yeah. Yeah, the, so the question is um, without the wording that we just, that somebody just um, deleted or put a strike through, um, without that, how would how would a, an inspector uh, have any basis for identifying the four unrelated if we don't leave in the words not related by marriage, et cetera, et cetera? What's what's our alternative to that language? I'm looking at Rob or John. Well, I guess I, I'm trying to understand what we're trying to get out of this, and and maybe we just ask the question: if if we're trying to understand if students are going to live in this unit, then we we're asking the applicant to tell us that their property is intended to be leased to occupants. You know, their occupants are intended to be individuals that are, you know, um, enrolled in the educational institution. I think we're just asking that question. And, you know, it's a it's a property owner that's going to be willing to tell us that that's their business, student rentals. Um, and I think we'll probably get a mix of answers to that, but I think we will no matter what. Uh, you know, anyone can answer this question any way they want until we're uh you know out there looking for something but at, at this point it looks like it's just trying to gather information so we should just ask the question we want the answer to Pam? okay so so in this case the number of units that are occupied one or more persons where during the lease period at least one will attend an institution um so that's that's okay that's okay i'm i was concerned about this being able to uphold um our otherwise definition of unrelated um occupants so for if if there's <clears throat> is there any place else in here that we that we remind um landowners or managers that the occupants can't exceed four unrelated well, i i think e The maximum total number of unrelated occupants in each dwelling unit as indicated on the lease and or enforced by the owner. Okay. Okay, so we do cover it. Is okay. everyone okay with the changes I proposed to G? I guess with the uh, speaking for myself, I guess with the addition of the words unrelated in E, which is a new change, um, I guess I could accept that we take out that definition in G. Because we really are trying to find out the occupations of the people in the in the in the apartment and if they're students, they're students. And that's what we want to know. Um, Shalini. Wait, can we just ask, I know someone just said, ask that, but I don't know what the answer was. Can we just ask whether they're going to be undergrads, grads, or I don't know. I mean, you probably could, right? You'd have to word this one differently. And then the, the, applications for all of the rentals would have to be even more specific, right? Um, mm. And then what if you've got one grad student and one undergrad right. student, right? You know, right. Um, I think right. I would say start this way, see what kind of, if we're going for information, mm. see what we get. It, it might, you know, mm -hmm. even just this information may help Rob and his staff figure out 
what buildings and dwelling units to start with on on in inspections, right? If that's our goal. Um, so. Mm. Okay, and then um, did we put that on a side note to be decided later what Jennifer just said about registering houses and creating that category of student housing? So that, that, that would be a bylaw, a zoning bylaw proposal and change if it can okay. even be done. But that, that we're going to have a couple of conversations both later today and then I think mm. next week is a planned thing about housing conversations in CRC. Right, right. Um, right. So. Yeah. Okay, great. So that's where that will go. Okay. And then I had another sort of unrelated sort of related question, which is in the last public hearing, we heard from landlords about um, some of the things that were said was not making this process un too cumbersome. And I, I was just wondering how much, how many of these questions or how much is this changing from what it is already in terms of the requirements? Rob or John? I, I mean, I think E and G at a minimum are new, but Rob? Yeah, E and G, I mean, we are asking the question, uh, we are asking number of maximum number of occupants in a dwelling unit now. So we're, you know, not exactly asking these questions this way uh so yeah those two look like the only ones that might be different from what's on our standard application process now pam oh sorry my hand is still up okay um seeing no other hands for this section we're going to move on um i is the energy efficiency information it's the only thing left, and this is again for what application questions, application requirements, information on the applicant application. Um, Rob recommends deleting I. Um, I know we as a committee had said we need to talk about I. Um, so um, thoughts on I, whether to include it, whether to include a some set, whether to take Rob's recommendation and delete. Rob. So just to explain, you know, I am starting to look at this, um, the bylaw and the regulations, uh, comparing them to what we have now and just trying to summarize the changes that are being proposed. And um, as important as this is, I think it needs to be a standalone effort, um, you know, that we can certainly assist with. We will have contact lists to owners and we can, you know, send surveys and and try to gather information over time but uh as i look at the bylaw even with my adjustments it's it's going to be a big deal uh for staff it's going to be a big deal for property owner managers uh arranging inspections uh so i i just don't think we need to to go this far with it right now i think it's probably you know gets to a point where it's not manageable for everybody involved anyway and try to look for ways to uh, to support our sustainability director and uh, these efforts um, outside of the bylaw as a requirement of the bylaw. Thank you for that explanation. Pam. Yeah, I had been I had been thinking that the that the items underneath um, I were pretty heavy and pretty heavy handed. Um, I'm, but I'm trying to understand or get my head around the fact that maybe um, there is some certain baseline information that we might want to know, especially as it applies to perhaps um, aggregating purchase of heat pumps or purchase of other, you know, solar panels or something like that. Uh, one of our landowners, landlords, mentioned that you know there are lots of incentives for for um, homeowners to get rebates for certain you know upgrades and efficiencies but there really is nothing for landlords or for property owners rental properties um, and so there were a couple of things that felt like they qualified to be um, just to give the town a sense of what's out there like um, 
are there any vehicle charging stations on your property? Yes, no, you know, or how many, you know, zero to five, whatever, so that um, we have a sense across town, maybe, maybe we can get some good deals on charging stations for rental properties. Um, the, the existing kilowatt hour composition of any solar panels or something like that is also not a bad baseline. I mean, if somebody doesn't have solar panels, they can put a fat little zero in that box and it's not much work. But it, I think it would give the town, especially Climate Action Group, might give them a starting point for encouragement and or, you know, none of this is being mandated. So those are the kinds of things that I thought might be helpful in the long run to give us a, a sense of across the board capacity in town. Shalini? Uh, you're muted, Shalini. Sorry, I was going to say something similar uh, along the lines of what Pam just said, that is there a core set of like not all of them, but not getting rid of all of them, but could we or maybe send it back to ECAC, like what is a core set or maybe two questions that are absolutely fundamental that every landlord should know about and maybe there's a way that benefits them. And I was just thinking maybe this is not related, but I, I think it is. Well, so something like mass save. Uh, so when we our electricity includes, uh, we are paying for it where our electric companies are supposed to be able to provide a free assessment and do energy audits for free for residents and do some of the uh, you know basic retrofitting and what of that at a very discounted price. And I should know that, but I didn't. And I kept postponing it till they came and said, no, you're paying for this actually. And and that was like, what? I didn't realize that. So I just mean like, is there something like that that could be even offered as, do you know about the free mass savings? So are you taking, you know, taking advantage of that or something like that, which we could get from ECAC who are more informed about this, that this could be a venue not to be cut with a idea of being cumbersome for the landlords, but just using this as a way to inform landlords that there are these resources that you could be utilizing and are you utilizing them? Yeah, um, looking at some of these, some of the questions are something that's on a property card and seems duplicative to require landlords to look up just to get a rental permit. Um, Whereas as Pam was saying, something like E here might be worth asking a question for just to get an idea, which is the electric charging stations. Um, they may or may not end up on a building or electrical permit request. It depends on who does it, I think. Although I guess in, in, in rental properties, they probably do need an electrical permit. Um, but, um, you know, the type of insulation in, in exterior walls and ceilings, I wouldn't even know how to answer that if I was renting a property, right? Like, how would I even answer that? So, so you know, I think maybe Pam's solution, some of these that are quick yes, no answers that don't take research and aren't on a property card, that could help us. Um, you know, even PV should have a, a permit, but they should also know, right? Um, but the the one that I think would be useful on a rental application is who pays for the energy bills. Maybe not the annual costs, but who pays for them. Yeah. might be worth asking, but not the annual cost, because if the tenant's paying the annual cost might be very hard to come up with. But but something like, let, let me put some of these in. If I reject that one and these two, you know, those might be, those would probably be the three that I would keep. I don't know if there's others others would keep. Um, I, if I could, yeah. Um, the if I think about 
again, sort of townwide, how many of our rental units are on fuel oil for heating now? Fuel oil, electricity, um, propane or natural gas. That's again, kind of a baseline. And um, we sort of have a, a sense of how far we have to go to overcome some of that. So you would even that one. That one's another one that shouldn't need research and should just be an easy checkbox or something. Right. Um, you know, so Rob, what are your thoughts of those four, keeping those four maybe? You're muted, Rob. So I haven't heard anything that I think we either don't have or, you know, we need to have. Um, you know that some of this information is on the property cards. No one's ever asked us to report on the size of the solar uh, installations, and we have that information. You know, we can go five years of rooftop solar permits and report on that, and never been asked that. So I think if if there is a question for a purpose, we can help find that answer. We can help gather that information. We can send the message to the landlords in an efficient way that's not part of the application process, hopefully in a time they might be interested in it because they're not gonna be interested in it when they're just trying to get their rental permit. So I'm looking for ways to make this uh, quicker, easier for the applicant and less uh, involved for us to build out for information that we, yeah, might be nice to have, but probably not gonna do anything with. Uh, so that's, you know, I guess my response to that. Shalini? Do we want the mass savings question, Rob? No. So, so that one is different for commercial properties than homeowned properties. Yeah, so that's it may not true. actually. That's matter. true. Rob is personally convincing me that we should just eliminate the questions completely. <laughs> yes, that's true. I mean, especially we're hearing there's so much of concern about how involved this process is. So. Pam? I'm just thinking if I was thinking of adding the massive only because that's a benefit that many landlords may not know, but I, yeah, I don't know if it's available. I know it's available for up to four units, but not, I don't know if it's mass saving free audits and all are available for apartment buildings. And so I don't know. Pam and then Rob. Sure. So just to confirm um, Rob's office through inspections or, or building permits knows um, if there are electrical charging stations, they know if there are any um, PV panels being installed and they have some sense of um, of fuel at the property. I can't remember you know, if mine is listed on my property card. Rob? If, and if yes, I would agree to taking them out of this. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, you know, we really like the NASA program and encourage users, you know, people, owners to take advantage of that. And I'm, I'm much more in favor of, uh, you know, efforts on our part to educate when there's programs available, rebates available. And I know Stephanie can help us with that. Uh, if it's, if it's organized and prepared, we can very easily distribute that information. And I think that would be much more valuable. Uh, to, to work on doing that throughout the course of the year. Thank you. We've got a couple more minutes before we're going to move on. We'll move on to the inspection requirements. The frequency schedule um, goes over two pages. Rob has basically, do you want to talk about us? It looks like from my brief reading that you're moving to a five-year without sort of a three-year, five-year tiered, everything is five years unless you want it shorter. Is that sort of the goal of these potential changes? You, that's right. So I, you know, looking at this, um, it, it was it kind of makes it really hard to follow. Some things are three years, five years, four years. And I'm like, why are we doing this? There really doesn't it doesn't need to be this complicated. Um, and thinking back, what are the goals of this effort? What are we trying to get out of this? You know, we want to get uh, inspections of properties. We want to ensure uh, safe conditions, but we also want to be much more aggressive in the enforcement than we have been in up until this point. So I think, you know, looking, trying to focus on the things that are important coming out of this program, we need to simplify it. 
make it easier to understand uh, and easier to uh, manage and uh, build a program that we actually can can manage effectively and efficiently. So uh, let's keep it all, everything five years. I mean, there really wasn't, there's not a whole lot of advantage of being called a compliant home. So let's not make it out to be something more than it is. But, um, you know, I think put it on a five-year schedule, um, identify the, the areas where um, shorter uh, inspection requirements are necessary and let's focus on those. Those are the problems. So let's, let's make sure the bylaw gives us the authority to do that when we need to. Okay, Pam. So in, again, in reading this new information, um, it looks like um, D, which is the frequency schedule, one D is the annual or other periodic inspection. So if there is a violation of any state or local reg, whether or not a notice of violation is issued or failing an inspection, may be subject to inspections on, a, on another frequency. Um, I just want to make sure that 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 also comports with what the nuisance bylaw is trying to say, which is, you know, X number of complaints in a year triggers this, triggers that. Um, will that translate into violation of any state or local regulation? So D2 deals with the nuisance property one, which we might have to modify based on what we do with nuisance. But residential rental property designated a problem property or nuisance property under general bylaw 3.26 may be subject to inspections on a frequency deemed necessary, but not less than annually. We do cover it. Yeah. So I think. I, you know, I, I support these changes. We just have to do some rewording because we've now got two titles of five-year inspection requirements. So I'll play with the fixing of the making it work. Um, I still have my hand up. Oh, uh, yep, yeah, Pam. Um, so I'm not uncomfortable with most of these changes, but but I'm but I I need to be reassured that. Um, initial inspections as a property comes in to the system that there is, in fact, I, I just don't feel like we can wait five years to get everybody inspected initially. And even if we, even if we have to go hire some inspectors to, you know, or contract some inspection services or something, um, I don't want to give them a five-year window because they could just really run rampant, especially if they know they're only going to get really inspected once every five years. Um, that worries me and I'm and I'm not seeing coverage for that. Um, Rob and then Shalini. So this doesn't say that we have to wait five years. Um, that's going to be up to us and how we staff the program. It's, it's saying that the initial inspection will occur within five years. And any new property into the program uh, would be inspected within six months. So if the, pro if the program is staffed properly, maybe we can do it in two or three years. We'd be glad to do that. But if not, the bylaw does say that it has to be done within five years, no later than five years. With the goal of being a lot quicker than that. Absolutely. I mean, that, that can be a goal that is established, but, you know, the, the, um, the staffing that we're suggesting, uh, I'm hopeful, is going to have a strong enough emphasis on enforcement and uh, not just all inspections. So we've got to balance that with the time that we're going to have staff available. Uh, so, we, you know, the, the, the department gets, the, the staff gets pretty large to do everything. Shalini. 
Yeah, and I think uh, the staff knows which are the problematic houses already. So in terms of inspection, is it possible that they start off with those homes? And I, I mean, we don't know what that order is going to be of inspections in the first round, right? But maybe, yeah, the staff can just start with those homes so we don't have to wait longer. Rob? So we don't know the problematic homes. Um, we haven't done inspections of the majority of the properties that we're talking about in this program. We, from year to year, have somewhere around two dozen properties that I would say are uh, properties that are issues for us. And really what uh, started the conversation for me to have the ability to uh, have follow-up inspections and require things of those properties. But those are, those are 20 plus properties that are found in response to the three to 400 complaints that we respond to every year. So this, when we start going into properties and seeing the conditions of them and understanding them better, then we'll have a true sense of the problem properties or the ones that need improvements. We don't have that now. So the other thing I noticed is once we go to a standard Five year without instead of three year, I think we can delete C1 and C3 because they don't really do anything since it's already five. Um, but I will, I will, as I create the new version, I'll I'll make sure that we're not losing anything by those deletions. I would move section C2 actually down to the annual or other periodic inspections because it seems like that's more of belongs more in that one of things that change the five year. And so change of ownership would change from five to something else. Um, so that's just the comment I wanted to make there. Um, if there's no other comments, numbers two and three, number of units inspected. Oh, Pam? Yeah, actually um, looking at number two, I understand where Rob is going with that. Um, change of ownership. I I would like to actually keep that a requirement with change of ownership rather than might be able to continue under the under the prior ownership. And the reason I say that is it's going to be non-owner occupied. It's going to be a rental. We're talking about rentals here. Um, I want every new property owner to be totally aware of what Amherst requires, even if it was just inspected the prior year, I want them to understand that Amherst means business. And I would I would actually um, urge consideration of, of, of just making it mandatory. Okay. John. Even, even though it means more work for the staff. Uh, we can't hear you despite the unmute. Make sure it's the right mic. Can you hear me now? Yes. Um, I agree uh, with what Pam was saying. Rob and I had a conversation about this today, and there's a couple properties before us now that have just changed hands, and they would benefit from, you know, uh, an inspection right off the bat. Um, there's no reason to, it, it's what was said, you know, they just had an inspection a year ago, so we're going to hold off for four years. They ought to, we ought to have a presence there so that the new landlord understands um, that this is real. I will make that change in the next draft. We are about out of time. Um, so I will mark, since we didn't really get to this one, I will mark that we start our review here next time. Um, just so we don't lose the place. Pam, and John, you put your hand up. Pam, you may go and then, okay. okay sorry, I thought John had. Um, I just want to note for subsequent conversations that having a more consistent five-year uh, inspection program means we really do need to think about the permit fees differently. And I'm really pretty sure without doing a whole lot more thinking than right now that we need to decouple um, 
inspection service fees from normal annual renewals. There's just, you know, how do you bury five years worth of inspection cost into a permit? That's not fair. Noted. Okay. We are at this point going to, let me save this, um, move on on our agenda. We will come back to this. I will put it on next week, two weeks from now's agenda. Um, And I do want to say thank you very, very much, uh, um, Rob and, and John, if you were involved in, in actually putting your thoughts down on this, because we sort of floated around these issues and it's it's really nice to start pinning it down. Yep. Okay. Trying to manage too many screens here. <laughs> um, next up on the agenda is um, the engagement report. So, um, okay, the engagement report is next. Shalini, um, let me see if I can pull this up, unless you want to pull it up. Shalini, maybe you should pull it up. You're muted. Since since you yeah. you've been keeping a master document, any changes we ask would be probably better on your computer than mine. Uh, I was just gonna pull up what's on the it's in the packet. Yeah. Okay. Hold on. Uh, share screen. Oops. None of these. Hold on. Hmm. So as I'm pulling it up, just the back end stuff that we had agreed on, I made those changes. And now we're going to start from the beginning, moving down. Yeah. Um, so is this the executive summary? Yeah, we're going to start with that, the yes. fun part. But again, I just invite everyone to keep a line. Like now we're more steeped into, and we've heard from different people. And so I think the invitation is really that what we heard from different people, how can we pull out what's important in that uh, and that goes into the executive summary that can help us as we are wrapping down our um, um, bylaw, what, um, what can we add and look at just to make sure that as we're making these changes to the bylaw, we are incorporating maybe not everything, what everyone said, but just the sentiment of what is being said. Have we looked at it? Have we heard them? And are we reflecting that in the changes? So, um, yeah, go ahead, Mandy Jo. Uh, yeah, as, as we've been doing, we're going to work our way through this. I know Pam sent me some question, some potential changes, but that's in a, that's farther down in the document, right, Pam? I think that's in some parts we talked about last time. So we will get there mm -hmm. what, you know, beforehand, but Pam, I thought we'd start through this first, but Pam. Sure. Um, first and foremost, I think it would be very, very important to change the date on this so that it's going to be March, 2023 or April when it, we get finished, whatever, um, because um, I think Having right. had the the uh, unreviewed draft, non noted as draft document out that that call that was called October twenty twenty two, I think right. it's really important to make sure that this is clearly a final document rather than mm -hmm. a viewed one. And then do we want to change anything in the title? Like, is that okay that it's prepared by us for the community? Resource committee. I I think we would if one when we finally vote we can just add adopted by mm -hmm. CRC. Yeah, and you can remove all date, of this. Like okay. That. Okay. And manager, we, we, are you making a note of that? No, you should make the notes on this okay. with the track changes if you can. Oh wow! Yes. <laughs> Ooh, interesting. Never done that before. That's kind of cool. I feel so so important. powerful. Yes, powerful. <laughs> right, right. Okay. Uh, and Hour this of is, ten. <laughs> I don't change to, uh, but it's going to be so slow if I do it because I'm doing it uh, for the first time. So change to um, as adopted by uh, CRC. Okay. 
and then the date and then Jennifer. So I wanted to, um, it's maybe not the time to ask it, but since we're, since it came up about the date that we're adopting it, um, can we say somewhere in the executive summary that because there are two versions out there and mm. it'll be this one and the October one and neither are marked draft. So I keep thinking at some point in the future when none of us are around to kind of explain what happened, that it be clear that this is the version that was adopted by the CRC and not, mm -hmm. and that the October 2022 was a draft. Because people can just uh -huh. pull up that October 2022 and start quoting from it and unless we right. formally note somewhere two or three or four years from now, mm -hmm. you know, there'll be. No, that's a good point. Good. The title will have the adopted date on it, but I'm looking at this very first paragraph of executive summary, the second sentence mm. that says this report is a summary. You could put this report adopted by CRC on X date is a summary of that, which would add a little bit of language and clarity in too. Okay, can you say that again? This report. This report, comma, adopted by CRC. How make the change of on, and then we'd add a date whenever we vote vote. Uh-huh. Is this some and then also in the October one, if it's wherever it is, can we put like a big cross or something that says that this has been replaced by or something? The so thing is it, people that already have it, we can't. Yeah. No, not that, but I can have a public to change the title of that on the yeah. in the packet at least. But yeah. okay, that was the October third meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay, and these are all good things to note for when we do community engagement in the future too. So it wasn't a perfect process by any, but it was a first time process. Yeah. yeah. So, and Shalini, so on that same note, that's a really good suggestion to sort of show that this report adopted da da da. And then you could just say any any versions um, mm. with earlier dates are Oops. are not valid. Uh huh. Should I add that here? Yeah, just you, you can fix the language for okay. our next meeting because we've only got twelve minutes left. We're not oh, finishing oh, today. Oh shoot! Right? Yeah. Okay. Any other? Okay. Yeah. yeah okay. Did, did, yeah, did, did, no, did, did, we're did, 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 did. we're not going to get to a vote today. Okay. Yeah. We're, yeah. Okay. We're okay. Slowly okay. taking things to try and get through <laughs> as many things and move things along as we go. So right. Like that, so, the so the purpose was like what was stated and agreed. So I don't think there is anything there. Well, let's stay with purpose and what we did. Are there any requested changes? Okay. In those two sections. Mm. I think we didn't do much on the climate action goals, but it was it was a primary purpose initially. Yeah. Well, I knew we did have questions about it in the quantitative, the rating that we had people do, the tenants and uh, only the tenants because it's relevant to them. And, and that was one of the interesting findings that in the quantitative data where they were asked specifically how important are these or where you have the most, how satisfied are you? And uh, the utility bill, but also energy efficiency was one of the top things for tenants, like as you see on page 10. However, in the qualitative data, when they were just asked open-ended questions, like what do you love? What do you want to change? What are your challenges? That did not come up as much. So that's why we use two different methodologies is because when you prompt people like how important is solar energy, everyone's like, oh yeah, it's very important. But when you actually get people to talk about what are your actual challenges in your day-to-day -day life, they're not really bringing that up. So to me, that points out, we still need to do a lot of job in educating people and getting people's awareness about climate change. Any changes to the who responded section? It looks like there was some deletions there in this draft. And I also pulled in, I think the addition was also pulling in the graphs earlier so people can hmm. see them. Saves the words because you can see the, right. the graph. Yeah. 
Okay, I think you can go down. And there's the graph. Yeah, so here you have the, um, the race. And then this was, this was, uh, I think Jennifer had a question earlier, how come no one responded in that age category? But so this makes it more clear that we did get responses in the different age categories. Yeah, that's helpful. Yeah. So should I move down then? I think okay. this is, okay. So this is where we really um, get started. Um, we have some active seniors. <laughs> we do have a two humped town, basically. <laughs> we do. <laughs> oh, are we looking at that still? No, you, you can stay okay, here. Gonna, okay. Um, okay, so with the first paragraph and the first key issues related to the licensing fee and clear licensing program. So some of the headings were readjusted because as people pointed out, it was not very clearly. So now the main category, the first main category is uh, the licensing fee and a clear licensing program. So all the issues that came up over here. Any requested changes? I'm having trouble just sort of reading and suggesting changes here. I, I have I have not um, prepared text for most of this. And I did incorporate uh, what uh, Pam you had sent earlier and Jennifer. So and uh, one other counselor who had sent comments. I incorporated. I think all of them, other than where I may have said. Um, the reason why so um okay why don't we go down page down a little bit farther wait there was really just okay I mean, some of the things with the licensing we're hearing, we heard from landlords, even when they came last time that, you know, there's a need for simplifying and clarifying the process. And I heard Rob acknowledging that and talking about that. So I think we're aware of that issue. So should we go to the second one? The yep. key issues concerning complaints, the complaint process and fines. And I think this is an interesting thing, maybe for the staff also, that 88% of the tenants knew who to contact in case of maintenance safety issues, but only 45% of neighbors knew who uh, who to call if they perceived a building or safety code violation in a neighboring rental property. So I thought that was interesting. Um, I think we can page down. Okay. considerations and questions. What are fair ways to define accountability? So this is something we're going to be looking at more, I think, in the nuisance bylaw too. Who's accountable uh, for the bio when the bylaws are violated? For example, noise, littering, parking. So these are just questions that when we are discussing the relevant either regulations or um, the nuisance bylaw, we can make sure that we address these. Should I move on to the third one? Yep. So, can I just say uh -huh. um, the last one, 11, because Rob did say today that they do enforce it. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, so it, that, it might be that's more That's a good, of good catch. <laughs> a perception of enforcement. Right, Something okay. Like Could, okay. Uh, so I'll just write that rephrase as perception or something. Yeah. Rephrase as uh, and I think I think what Maybe I also highlight what you just wrote so you know to oh that's find. true thank you uh where do I highlight that uh track changes no uh, for everyone. no just go to like home 
Yeah, right. If you go back to home. Yeah. Oh, there. Okay, cool. There you awesome. go. Yeah. Also, uh, can I just say that Rob said that when people complain, we're good with reinforcing. And that's been the problem is that uh, it was only complaint driven. And so if people don't know, or if they're afraid to complain or whatever, then that's why we, so we are hearing this discrepancy on the one hand staff is it re, is enforcing it based on complaints, but we also know from neighbors that they're still having and encountering these issues. So there's definitely a gap there and hopefully between the nuisance bylaw and this bylaw, that's gonna be resolved. Okay, then the key issues concerning inspections and inspection standards. Um, in the top five areas of dissatisfaction for tenants and residents, they included management of the building, interior, exterior, and tenants also mentioned energy efficiency and residents mentioned trash disposal and parking as top concerns. So I think with energy efficiency, was that meaning like, um, because there were some tenants who said that mm -hmm. they have windows that don't close and you know, don't fully close, um, that just there were those properties um, suffering from deferred maintenance, mm. you know, are not energy efficient and they're right. not healthy either because of- Or safe. <laughs> right, or safe, right. They're just- <laughs> right. right. Energy compliance is the result of all this, yeah. Yeah. And Pam? Um, well, actually, that doesn't have anything to do with inspections or inspection standards, but the concerns that the that residents, meaning, I guess, the non-tenants, um, mm -hmm. trash disposal parking, and I know there were a number of noise complaints as well, but again, that's not inspection related per se. It's, it's enforcement, right. not inspection. Right. And that's why that's not here. But I don't know. And uh, Rob, it might be interesting for you all to see the tenants and me. I don't know how many of these items are there already being inspected, like uh, fire exits and mold and rodent infestation. I don't know if these things are checked for, but I thought that was interesting to get the whole list of things that tenants are concerned about. And then from residents' point of view, I think we have other things. Uh, and then there was this, uh, should there be another permit category for owner-occupied and long-term uh, rentals? Okay, number four. Hold on. That's an example of, it never was stated outright in the, in the text or in mm -hmm. the answer. This mm -hmm. is a, this is a, um, I don't know. I, I'm going to inference or it's like, okay. So these are recommendations. So these are considerations. This is not so the so the second part of the report is the actual reporting of the data. And this part is it gives us as a committee a little more leeway to say, okay, this is what we heard. And these are the questions that are coming up for us. So this is I just pushed I just started out, but these are by no ways if we don't agree as a group that that's a relevant question question, we can delete it. And if you have other questions, we can add them. But these questions don't have to be coming from the reported data. Rather, this is an inference or what we are drawing. Yeah. Right. And I think that's where I've had trouble is there's a lot of separating. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We need to move on. So I, I think, yeah. Okay. I, I don't know whether Number four, is that the last one in the executive summary? No. No, I don't think so. No. So, so I think we will put this on mm -hmm. another agenda. Um, Sounds good. <laughs> but up to four, it might be helpful to accept the changes Please. so that we can see a clean draft since we've briefly reviewed them all as we sort mm -hmm. of try to clean this up with all the changes. Um, and then we'll put a new draft into the packet that, mm -hmm. And we'll start at number four the next time um, this is on the agenda. Um, I'm working with very full agendas. So um, as you can tell, we're moving right. on. We're trying so to touch on this. a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. 
Um, the next item on the agenda is, um, where am I, is um, the a discussion of the prior carryover items, um, prior council carryover items. Um, so this one is on the agenda. It's kind of related to something I'm probably going to put on the agenda next time, but we our next committee meeting is after the retreat and Lynn has requested, as many know, some status of a lot of this. Um, and I, I thought we'd have a discussion before I could give that status to her on this particular one, um, you know, and and see what what the committee thinks. So I am going to put, hold on. Um, let's see if I can get that part on my screen. Um, this is the carryover items. This is the text of almost the motion that was made. It was not a motion to refer to CRC. It was a motion to direct the town manager to essentially have the planning staff report back to the council or CRC by these dates, a whole lot of stuff. The planning staff then reorganized it all um, and did their own sort of phase one, two, and three. I don't have that here because I'm not sure it necessarily matters for this conversation how their review was. That motion has never been withdrawn or removed, or I'm not sure how you want to call it. That direction to the town manager still exists, is what I would say. And so I think what the conversation for today I'd like to hear from the committee members is, do we have a recommendation on Given that the motion was not for us to work on this, it was for the manager to direct the manager to have his staff work on it. Do we have a recommendation regarding to the council regarding these items as to whether we or the council should still be asking the managers to have staff work on these particular things or Given the conversation I hope to have next week relates to the housing thing that we discussed briefly during the hearing two weeks two weeks ago was the hearing um, regarding potential things to deal with housing. I, I don't know how I've worded it in a draft agenda, but but uh, issues surrounding housing and how to address housing. Um, and so do we still want the direction from the council to the manager to be working on these items or do we potentially want to be discussing other items that we might be asking the manager, asking the council to direct the manager to work on or taking on on our own. That's a very long-winded and confusing thing. Um, I hope it kind of makes some sense, um, but let's focus on these particular ones that were part of that direction first um, and whether they still remain priorities versus potential other priorities we might want to recommend to the council, I guess is is the way to say it. Pam. Um, first of all, I don't have I don't have a new list that I would like to recommend to the town council at hand at the moment. So I don't right. really want to go there. Um, the the number of zoning suggestions that were put to the town um, planning department in the previous council were were numerous and they worked their tails off trying to deal with um, the 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 weight of of all the suggestions um, to be dealt with. We saw in the conversations footnote M was a complete disaster. Um, we saw changing footnote B in the BL and footnote A to maximize lot coverage also came up with some very, very strong opposition to, to that. Um, the only one that, that is with this general work with the council to begin a conversation on housing types expansion, I believe you were trying to do with your duplex um, bylaw. But from my perspective, the town staff 
has, you know, like one of these items that actually went into, I'm trying to remember exactly what went into the town manager's um, goals, but but the whole first category of by March 15, that didn't really make it into the town manager's goals, nor did the second group, which is by September 1, 2021, make it really into the town manager's goals maybe with a couple of exceptions if I read them really, really carefully right now. Um, the only one that I think made it through was form-based zoning design guidelines. And that was more because staff said they were already working on it. Um, but I, I don't have a good reason to pursue most of these topics. Other thoughts? Jennifer. Um, yeah, I, I would agree because I remember like Christine <clears throat> Brestroff, I'm not sure if it was last year, maybe it was the beginning of last year, going through, you know, the first, the uh, zoning priorities directed to work on by March 15th. And I think she said, you know, that <clears throat> the previous council, <clears throat> excuse me, continued to you know, adopt zoning changes really, I think through December of 2021, but that she had said, um, you know, adding footnote A and removing footnote M. And I think the one about uh, adding the BL to footnote B, those are ones she definitely said they weren't, I thought she said they weren't gonna be pursuing them. So I don't, I would support removing, removing those. Felony, do you have any thoughts before I give mine? I'm sorry. I'm in the car, so I'm not going to okay. turn it on. Uh, but um, uh, I, I mean, I think to me, the most important thing is a comprehensive housing plan. And, and that's something we've all agreed on. And so everything that contributes towards uh, towards uh, operationalizing or putting that into action, I think it still should be on the table till we've discarded the items. But also I want to point out that Chris had presented to us, I think there were five items that she had said when we were going through the matrix in the beginning of our time together, CRC. And she had these items for it, uh, for acting on the comprehensive housing plan. And I'm not sure if that's here in this list. <clears throat> so it's not on this list because this is specifically, this, oh, right. this conversation is specifically in response to, I, I think Pam, you asked for it, but also um, Lynn sent out that request, get me all the referrals plus all the carryover items and what you're doing with them. And I didn't feel like I, I could answer a lot of them for the referrals. Um, I, I haven't actually given her dates on the referrals or anything. I, I just sent her our list of referrals. There's one referral that relates to this that that um, I, I wouldn't be able to supply an answer to right now. Um, but I had no information really on how to answer that question with relation to this particular thing, which is in some sense a carryover item. Um, so that's why okay. it's on here. It's so it doesn't necessarily relate to those prior presentations, although everything kind of interconnects when you're talking zoning and housing. Um, Jennifer, and then I'm going to take an opportunity to do my thoughts. Um. So I guess to, to zone it, to hone in on one of them, um, like removing footnote M, that's crazy. Um, footnote M, I think should be re, could be revisited, you know, because it already allows for too much density. Um, I think you can have nine structures per acre and removing footnote M would increase it to 12 or more. Um, so it came up at the last planning board meeting, although it was veering off topic because but um, some of the public comment was about um, <clears throat> a property at 98 Fearing Street, which had been a single family house. And then the single family house was divided into a triplex. And then the property 
changed hands in 2021 and the property owner actually came to the local historic district commission with a request to add three more structures and it's not really it's not a large property with three units in each structure with four bedrooms in each one literally when you add the main house and he was very clear it was for students it wasn't to provide attainable housing for anybody that there would be 36 bedrooms on this lot and a 21 space parking lot and that in, in no world does that make sense. So I think if we are going to revisit footnote M, it's too, it, it allows for too much density as it is to remove it is kind of a non-starter. So I'd like to see, so, so that's my footnote, removing footnote N is in no way something we should be recommending. That That's my opinion. And I think footnote M as it is allows for too much density. So, um. I would actually disagree with Jennifer on whether that conversation was valuable or not and what the density in the RG, our densest district should be and should allow. But um, looking at this list, here's my thoughts. Some of it talks about the business districts. A lot of it kind of talks about the residential districts, right? Um, but it's all very prescriptive. It's, you know, add this to this, remove this from this. Um, the, you know, at least the March 15 ones were very prescriptive, basically. Um, whereas the September 1 ones, dimensional regulations in the RGRVC, let's talk about that, or lower barriers to development of duplexes and triplexes. Um, frontage regulations, that's actually part of dimensional regulations, right? Um, the frontage regulations are in the dimensional regulations, a little less prescriptive. I think. What I would like to see is um, that maybe we recommend that the council, I wouldn't call it rescind the direction, but change the direction to the town manager, maybe another vote, or maybe do we even need to do that versus just have the conversations. I'm not sure what it would be, but I would remove these specific ones from that vote. I'm not sure what that would look like. Um, and I'd rather see a, a less prescriptive direction if we are going to go the direction of directing the town manager to do something, right? I would rather see a direction of let's talk about, and I don't know what the wording would be or anything right now, but let's talk about are we concentrating on housing? And if so, what type of housing or, you know, is it, you know, similar to this lowering barriers for development of duplexes and triplexes, very non-prescriptive other than let's focus on duplexes and triplexes is that one, right? Um, not necessarily in a particular region or maybe talk about what can we do in um, the RG and the RVC, but not necessarily <clears throat> it has to be dimensional regulations or it has to be fronted regulations or it has to be this talk about, you know, I think similar to what the planning board has recently talked about, which is where do we want to focus our efforts? And what do we want those efforts focused on? And so I think what I would like to see is maybe recommend that we remove this direction completely and come up with another sort of direction and focus that is not as prescriptive as this was back in March um, to to be able to give a lot more flexibility to whoever is working on this to think sort of outside the box or outside one specific thing. So that that's where I stand. Pam. I think I second that um, because again, most of these things did not did not make it into the town manager's goals again. So it's almost like it they're they're they don't exist except on paper, which keeps showing up on our agenda. Um, I, I I would like very much to rescind these and come up with some some broader objectives of what we're trying to achieve and and um, efforts that we think are valid to pursue. Shalini. First of all, I like what you proposed, Pandiju, uh, and kind of what you were saying, Pam. 
But I also just want to say that, you know, when, and this is more of a process thing, and even for future councils, like when the existing council does a lot of thinking through or, or not, but there are discussions and there are reasons why certain things are carried forward. So I wonder if there needs to be maybe, I don't know, like a summary of what was the intention behind these. And so, so even if we don't agree with a particular direction, I think we're kind of naturally doing that right now with what you propose, Mandy Jo, that we're taking into account the intention for what was proposed. And then as a new council, how do we wanna move forward? But I was just thinking like as a process, it's two years is not enough to do anything. And in every council, new council comes and starts all over again. It's, and I don't know what the solution is really, but other than the remaining counselors or maybe the earlier counselors who proposed that to give a little summary of what the intentions were, what was the Okay, we lost a little bit of that, Shalini, and I know she just muted herself. She might be going through something, but thank you. I think oh, we got. Uh, okay, it. did you um, did you get the gist of it though? I think we did. <laughs> okay. 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 Pam, your hand is back up. No. Okay. So I'm, I'm hearing a basic consensus. I don't know what this motion would look like. It might be a motion to recommend. Rescind doesn't seem, I, I don't think we wanna rescind the whole thing um, because the form-based guidelines, we definitely don't wanna rescind. I think we, we continue to want to move forward on those. It's more of the other ones. Um, so it, it might be a motion to recommend the council rescind the zoning priorities that the council directed the manager to work on by March 15, 2021 and September 1, 2021. That might just be the motion at this point. And leaves and it leaves the consultant. It money. would leave the consultant money in there. And okay. then this committee can work on another recommendation that starts sort of without, you know, with our own conversation maybe, instead of having could, these hanging out. I could second that. Kelly, were you able to get that motion? If yes. you could uh, oh, yeah. uh, do that or tell me the motion one more time, that would be fantastic. Let me, I'm gonna type it myself as I make it, cause you know, I just made that up. Um, so it would be a motion to recommend the council rescind the zoning priorities it directed the town manager to work on by March 15, 2021, and what's the other date? September 1. September 1, 2021. I think that's it. That's what I said. I'm going to read it back to make sure I got it correct. Okay. okay. Um, so you're moving to recommend the council rescind the zoning priorities it directed the town manager to work on by March 15, 2021 and September 1, 2021. Correct. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay. Any discussion? Shalini. So I agree with rescinding the March 15th one, but September one, is there a way to, I just feel like if earlier council members, and it could be any issue in any set of counselors, if they worked hard on something for so long and we may not agree with it, but can we, at least continue the like at least have a full-fledged conversation 
before we rescind something. So I agree that the March 15 was too prescriptive and whatever, but the September 1st, can we like write it in a way that we rescind that, but, and uh, the committee agrees to have a conversation about the September 1st. So at least it's respectful to it. When we leave and the next council comes and they completely like just totally disregard anything we've done and all like the rental registration, we spend a year and let's say we don't get it done. And the next council comes and they like totally rescind it is, it's not a good comparison, I apologize, but, but you know what I mean. Pam. Um, I, I think the idea of having a conversation about, about what we as the current council have for priorities moving forward, I think is really valid. But I think that there are, you know, there are a couple of counselors that are no longer on the council because there were differences of opinion. And I I don't support some of these, some of these items. That is why I ran for office, to be very blunt. Um, and I'm and I'm delighted to be reconsidering this list of priorities. So I'm very pleased to take them off the table, have a great conversation about what our priorities are now. Um, I know there was a lot of work that went into them and some of the some of the um, some of the efforts were were heartily, uh, opposed by many people, which is which is maybe why they stopped at this point, and these these particular items did not continue. Um, that's all. That's all I really need to say. Thank you, Jennifer. I guess I was going to say kind of the same thing. I don't. I think because of former elected body, these were their priorities. I mean, that is why you have elections. So um, I think this council can articulate their priorities. So I would support Mandy Joe's um, motion as presented. And the only thing I'll say is when I write a report on this, um, I will indicate that this is a precursor to potentially CRC coming back with new recommendations for zoning priorities. And, and that, you know, from someone who was on both, um, I think, the committee is learning. I think the council is learning, you know, how we go about all of this, um, but also how prescriptive or not we should be when talking about zoning priorities. Um, you know, and and I think we learned a lot with this motion that we can take to the conversation that will come up for continuing of zoning priority discussion and potentially recommending other zoning priorities, which may be very similar to these just might be worded differently. Um, so, but I will include the fact that CRC intends to continue a discussion about where zoning priorities, the council might wanna put its zoning priorities and potentially bring that to it within the report with this recommendation. Pam. I think the fact that, <clears throat> that at least four, four councilors in this, in the second council um, came forward to with with an interest in improving our our rental bylaws is a pretty good indication that that is a priority for us. And it was also trying to address a lot of the issues that that some of these very prescriptive things would have would have exacerbated. So um, I think I think we have spoken in that in that sense. We we have said. Um, Rental, rental bylaw and nuisance bylaw improvement is, is a priority. Okay. Any other discussion? Seeing none, we're going to move to a vote. Um, uh, where's my list? Um, Pam. Aye. Jennifer. Yes. Felony. Yes. Could you say that again? Yes. Okay, um, it just didn't come out clear, so I didn't want to assume what it was. And Mandy is an I, so that is a four-zero vote. Um, one absent. With one absent. Um, with that, um, we are moving on to public 
comment, um, general public comment, will be accepted on matters within the jurisdiction of CRC. Um, residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes at this time. Um, if you would like to make a general public comment, please use the raise hand button and I will recognize you in turn. And bear with me as I modify my screens again. So um, Renata Shepard, please unmute yourself and state your name and where you live and make your public comment. Hi, this is Renata Shepard from Amherst. And um, well, um, regarding that one hour response, you're talking about response to message. When I travel, for instance, um, I write to my tenants with information, like for emergencies that can wait, cannot wait until I come back, please call so-and-so at uh, X number versus like non-emergency when the, they can text my WhatsApp or text now or Google Voice or whatever. If I not get a one hour, maybe a one day response back. Um, if it is not an emergency, there's no need to respond within an hour. Um, if a tenant keeps calling or texting late at night with questions that can wait a day or two, what do you do? Um, the language that you seem to be using uh, will get landlords in trouble for many reasons. You know, They could complain that we're not responding, but again, was it a, you know, was the house on fire? You should call 911. <laughs> um, about this, um, also this um, incessant need to control every detail of how many people per unit, et cetera. Why not just set the rules in a way that it won't cause the very problem you want to squash? For example, garbage, noise, safety, and, and so on. So no one gets in trouble with the law for discrimination or there's no waste of time and paper creating like 30 pages of questionable rules. Students or not, uh, be them owners or renters, the fire code, state sanitary code, et cetera, already do that. And uh, Rob and John can attest to that and know what to look for when needed, when there is a need to actually look for that. And again, with over 5,000 rental units, I think that's in town, uh, how many actually do cause problems? Um, just have to respond to that. Those that every time that you guys talk about the rental regulations, it's either to resolve a problem that can be solved if there is a quick response from police, from the town, from the board of health, um, or uh, it, it, it's something that uh, you want to find out about a property, which brings me to the energy efficiency questions that are just, you know, just seem to be an annoyance. You know, you're asking for each homeowner all those questions as well, or just the landlord. And uh, what difference does it make in the end to just know about the about just the rentals? Uh, it'll just include, um, you know, increase the manager's work and raise the price of rent for everyone. There's no need to reinvent the wheel. And uh, please excuse my frustration. And thank you very much. Thank you for your comments, Renata. Um, Ashley Jensen, you had your hand up at one point, but you have lowered your hand. Okay, <laughs> I just wanted to make sure. You should be able to unmute now. Okay. It okay, will unmute. Yeah, if you don't respond, it will go louder and louder. Sure. Okay. Can, you hear, can you hear me we now? We can hear you now, Ashley. Okay, my name is Ashley Jensen, and I, I live in Amherst, and I was, it, it might come up in the subsequent meaning when you're also deciding on the zoning priorities. But I mean, I certainly would like to see affordable housing somewhere in the priorities, like as its own kind of subset, like housing in general and the rentals are a big deal, but is I didn't see the word affordable, I guess. And that would be nice to see in the priorities or you know, maybe there's other sections that I'm just not aware of. This was a very, very um, informative meeting, by the way. I'm just really impressed. And I just, I'm glad that I just saw this side because I usually don't. But um, yeah, I just, I want to put the, just the word affordable housing really at a more front burner and see it in the priorities, maybe even in several places. That's all. Thank you for your comment, Ashley. And um, you did write the town council recently. So thank you for writing about that. I think we're going to hear about that in just about a minute. Um, we have no other hands up. Um, so um, 
we are moving on. Minutes are not in the packet, so we will postpone. As, as far as I know, minutes are not in the packet. Did I? Yeah, minutes are not in the packet. We will um, postpone that till the next meeting, and I'll put them on the next agenda. Um, we're going to go to next agenda preview. So, oh, Pam, you're muted, Pam. You're still muted. There. There. <laughs> the um, the draft min minutes from 3-2-23 are in the packet. Oh, I totally missed them then. So if they are, then I'm blind. Um, <laughs> with that, then are there any changes to the <laughs> requested changes to the draft minutes? Thank you for noticing that, Pam. <laughs> There were a couple, and I've got to find my version of it so that I can find. Um, um, in, there are just a couple things. So this is on page three where it says, this is Frederick Hartwell speaking. Um, the, the last sentence is, Brestrup stated that, quote, professional management does not apply only to management companies, instead refers to anyone within a 20, a 20 mile radius. And it was just left off, the end of the sentence was gone. So I, I added capable of managing a property. So it was uh, Professional management refers to anyone within a 20 mile radius capable of managing a property. And that's right. it. That was it. Any other requested changes? Seeing none, um, I'll move to adopt the March 2nd, 2023 meeting minutes as amended. Second. Thank you, Jennifer. We will vote. We'll start with Jennifer. Yes. Melanie. Yes. We did not hear that, Charles. There we go. <laughs> Mandy is an I and Pam. Yes. That is adopted 4-0 with one absent. We are moving on. I don't have announcements, so we're going to move on to the next agenda preview. I believe Jennifer wanted to mention something. Um, yes, and actually it was, um, I believe you all recall that um, Ashley sent, Ashley Jensen, who just spoke, um, is a member of the Amherst Affordable Housing Trust, and she wrote to the council and asked, um, you know, if we could have a conversation about affordable um, housing in, in Amherst. And um, as the liaison to the housing trust, who unfortunately seems to always have other meeting conflicts on Thursday evenings, the housing trust meets one Thursday a month. I responded to Ashley and copied the co-chairs of the housing trust and Lynn um, about you know having the conversation and Lynn Greismer suggested that the appropriate you know place to start would be CRC. So I wanted to um, it wasn't on the agenda so I guess I wanted to just ask if it could be on our next agenda for the for the members of the CRC we could discuss you know having a meeting with the housing trust members and um, Ashley had referred it to the co-chairs of the trust and they'll probably put it on their next agenda if they would like to meet with us. But so I just wanted, I, th I think the appropriate way to do this is to ask that it be on our next um, CRC agenda so we can have a conversation about that since it wasn't on the publicly posted agenda. We probably shouldn't discuss the substance of such a meeting today. But I thought it was a terrific idea and I appreciate so that Ashley um, in, you know, initiated the conversation. Yeah, I, I can put it on the agenda. I think what I'm hearing from you is you want an agenda item to discuss um, a potential meeting with the trust. Yes, if that's the way we could do it, I'd like to suggest it today, but since it wasn't on the agenda, I don't think I can do that. Um, okay, so I can put that on the agenda. Um, yes, I can put that on the agenda. I just wanna make sure I, I put it correctly on the agenda and I will reach out to um, or actually, Jennifer, you're the trust liaison, right? Yes, with yes. with Pat DeAngelis. So we yeah. Can... So why don't you reach out to the trust to to see if any of the chairs would like to come to the meeting? This will not be a meeting talking about um, 
affordable we would, housing. They would like to have, a, I mean, I think if, again, the trust has to discuss it amongst themselves because Ashley yeah. could correct me, um, but, you know, she recommended it. And I think the proper channels is we discuss it, the trust discusses it. I can't imagine we wouldn't want to have it come together and have a conversation. Yeah, and the trust meets on the 23rd next. I no, think. I have to check. They only meet one Thursday a month. Oh, and they met okay. last Thursday. Okay. Um, so I will put it on the agenda to have a conversation. Um, why don't you contact the trust chairs to see okay. if either of them would like to be present for the conversation about not about affordable housing per se, but about a meeting <laughs> between us. And right. because things, you know, even if they haven't discussed it themselves, I think having right. the chairs here might be helpful to so them. that they can, you know, yeah. Right. So, so discuss and see, and if they can't make the 30th, let me know. Okay. Um, since you are the liaison, let's, let's right. go through you. <laughs> um, okay. um, but for now, I'll put it on the 30th. Um, and, and one thing that might be helpful is if they have a particular time between the 4.30 and 6.30 timeframe, we normally meet that they could okay, that's great. be easier for them okay. um, to come and, and join us if they would like to join us for our portion of this figuring out how that might work is sort of Great. what it would be. Um, but yeah, I will put that on. The other things I have on the agenda is um, finishing the regulations up, um, finishing our, our work through the regulations on rental bylaw, potentially talking about a fee structure and schedule. Um, I don't know whether I'll move to the engagement report or not. Um, I had a lot on. I will be deleting some of it. I had the nuisance house by law potentially on there too. Um, and then I guess the way I had put it on the agenda for now was a missing middle housing discussion, um, sort of how it was. It, I might rephrase that, but it, the goal was sort of what came up at the public hearing and a little bit after the public hearing about housing related to the proposal that we're currently dealing with on the zoning proposal, but people had indicated they wanted a wider discussion and and it would relate to these zoning priorities. So I'll probably rename it so it's not as specific, um, but trying to get that discussion started. Um, the meeting after the, sec the 30th, one week after that is our continued public hearing. Um, I need to talk to Pam about that, um, about what we'll do with that meeting. I have been notified that the Planning board's public hearing the day before will be postponed by two weeks um, because of the start of Passover that evening, and they don't like to have meetings on the start of major religious holidays. Um, and so they will, as far as I know, be opening their meeting and then immediately postponing the hearing for to two weeks later. Um, so I'll talk to Pam about how she wants to sort of deal with that as the hearing, since Pam's running that hearing, which may allow us, depending on what Pam's thoughts are on that, to add a little bit more beyond the duplex conversation to the April 6th agenda too. Um, the duplexes will have to be on it because that's what we've done. But once Pam decides what she wants to do, we might be able to split a lot of what I just said between the 30th and the 6th. Um, and 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 talk, but but that's sort of the plan for the next two meetings as we get through this, um, trying to get some of those discussions going, um, but also moving along regulations, moving along bylaw, moving along rental permitting. I would love to see rental permitting out of our hands by the end of April. Um, so we at some point we're going to have to discuss what we're doing with it. What our report back to the council is, how far we go before we report back. Um, it's too much for next week, so we'll figure out what we're doing, <laughs> what we're cutting. Um, Shalini, then Dave, and then Pam. So could I, again, uh, get the question, maybe the ch changes and edits from the committee for the community report, and that might expedite it? And because my hope is to get that done before we pass the, or make a recommendation. That would be the natural order of things in my mind. Yeah. Thanks. Which is why I'm trying to keep it on the agendas with that too. So, okay. Um, Dave. Yeah, thanks, Mandy. I know you don't want to go into detail right now, but it would be helpful for, for Jennifer going back to the um, 
Housing Trust and Ashley on the Housing Trust. Just, I could see that conversation when we get to it being very important for staff to know what the CRC is looking for, what, what will be the conversation because affordable housing, there's a lot there, there's a lot to unpack. So when you discuss it, it would be really helpful to know what you and the housing trust are looking for, because I think, you know, it's going to involve, it would involve me, it would involve uh, Nate Malloy and, and likely Rob. So the more, the more we can learn in advance of when the meeting happens, the better we, better prepared we can be. So thanks. Thank you. Pam. I don't have my hand up. You had sort of raised it and waved, so I didn't know whether that was a hand raised or not. It was not, I guess. It's not, I think. Okay, <laughs> I'm just trying to make sure I'm not missing anyone. Um, no other hands, that was the next agenda item. Um, I don't have any items not anticipated 48 hours in advance. Does anyone else? Seeing none, we're adjourned at 6.32 p.m. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dave. Thanks.